Okay, this is, you probably don't know who this guy is, Ben Burgess, it's his channel down here. And he is going to talk to Natalie Wynn on actually changing minds online. She's actually changing minds. Now, before we start a talk, you know, see what they have to say, let's see how she plans on changing the minds of incels. This is her video in on incels. Rob, Politburo, and Compromat, and we have webinar, podcast, and incel, short for involuntary celibate. The word incel was invented in the late 90s by a lonely bisexual called Alana, who created a website called Alana's Involuntary Celibacy Project that was essentially a safe space for people who just couldn't get it in. But in our own miserable moment of internet history, the word incel refers to a more specific community of mostly heterosexual men, centered around forums like incel.me and r slash brain cells. This group has recently gotten a lot of bad press because for the last few years they've been churning out mass murderers faster than Marvel can make Avengers movies. There you go. That's her idea of extending the olive branch, uh, accusing these guys of becoming mass murderers. But most incels aren't violent killers. They're just men. No, I'd say none of them are. <laughs> who've formed an identity around not getting laid. In this video, I don't want to mock incels or lecture them or even sympathize with them. I just want to understand who they are and why they're- She understands because she used to be a guy. Before Natalie was, I forget her, her guy name. When she was a guy, she would hit on the girls and mostly fail because that's the way it is with all guys. And then she'd have to go home and either rub one out or deal with blue balls. She understands what these guys are going through because she went through it when she was a he. he Natalie didn't gain any status until he became a she and became contrapoints. You know, so when she was a nobody, he, she, he struggled <laughs> just like the rest of the guys. So now we know what, what this person is about. Let's see what they have to say here. It's like, uh, you know, hardly anybody does this, you know, like actually arguing with like literal white supremacists uh, <laughs> and explaining why it does not actually make sense to say that the, you know, the white race is going to be, you know, wiped out in some way. Um, so, so this is, this seems like a lot, um, you know, even though, you know, maybe that specific thing, you know, you're sort of done and you haven't done a lot of that lately. Like it, it does seem like a lot of what you do is argue with things of various kinds that most people who agree with you about would just roll their eyes at. And I was wondering if you wanted. I find she doesn't really argue so much as she puts on plays and has games of dress up. <laughs> Just speak a little bit to what you see is like, you know, the value of that or why that's something that interests you. Well, I guess the way I see it, um, knowledge and maybe even reality itself is being divided into these bubbles and you can produce discourse for your own bubble. And that's what I think most people online do is they, you know, so if you're if you're a leftist YouTuber, most leftist YouTubers these days, I feel like they kind of make leftist content for a leftist audience. Well, that's what you do. You make con uh, content for a particular audience. Certain people are attracted to your content. And other people avoid it like the plague. I mean, how are you different from any other YouTuber? The answer is you aren't. Audience. And it becomes this, um, well, I don't know. It's like the secular version of going to church or something, right? You're going to hear a well-spoken person deliver things that you already agree with. Maybe you'll learn some new things, but like fundamentally, you're not, you're not. That's what you're doing. That's what you've always done. Trying to, there's not an attempt to like open up your worldview to an outsider and to say like, look from my way of seeing, you know. I guess, why do I do this? Well, I start- Gain status. You hate it, you were a, a desperate, low status guy. Then you converted to a girl. 
and opened up a YouTube channel and said the right things. And then you got an audience. So now you have higher status. And Mr. Burgess here, he's trying to up his status by having you on his podcast started on YouTube when there wasn't a whole lot in the way of like a leftist community there. There was this kind of feminist vlogger community and there was like the Young Turks. But apart from that, uh, you know, there wasn't like a really strong community, like a YouTube community. There wasn't a market, I guess you could say, uh, for and this type we, of content. You put a market and that's what you do. You are marketing yourself when... You're getting a piece of the pie. And um, so this was not something I went into because I was uh, had some kind of like calculation about like, oh, here's an audience that I can make content for. Like, I don't believe you because your actions don't point, you know, your actions do point to that. <laughs> your actions do point to you making content to become, you know, known and make money off it. It was more about confronting a problem that I saw on the platform itself, which was that it was entirely overrun with like a sort of far right, well, I should say sort of center right movement that was moving to the far right at a terrifying pace. So I guess this was the era of dunking on SJ. Really? Why is that? Why do you think more guys move to the right? Because you you and this Burgess fellow who represent the left are toxic to young men. You both embrace feminism, which is a, a hate movement towards them. So young men move to the, whatever friendly space they can that isn't dumping on them. The right doesn't really care about them either, but at least it's better at faking it. W feminists, snowflakes, 76 genders, all that. And I guess I thought what was happening is that people's like understandable frustration. When do you believe in 76 genders? <laughs> with people who are called social justice warriors were becoming their, the center of their politics. These social justice warriors are just intersectional feminists. And these guys call them SJWs because they're too cowardly to call them feminists. I'm annoyed at activists. That's my political worldview, is like what these people seem to be saying. Um, and I. No, they are not annoyed. They're scared. Because these, these aren't activists. You know, they're, they're not make, trying to make the world a better place thought like, oh, that's, that's really bad because, um, you know, okay, activists are annoying, sure. Right. But not these the ones. They're not activists for one thing, but they are vicious and they're effective. That's why culturally stuff that guys love like Star Wars and Star Trek and that have been ruined by feminist incursion. So they're very effective. And they're not activists. They're the norm. There needs to be activism against these people. The things that a lot of the things activists are saying are true. A lot of the causes that the activists are representing are important. And if no, you they're were... not. their cause is to dump on men and, and bully them and abuse them. That is the very opposite of that. These gender KKKs, they got to be uh, thwarted politics becomes anti-activism and that's basically what it is anti-sjw as it was called at the time that they're not anti-activism the sjws are feminist and they don't do activism they're just a, an abusive hate movement like uh, not only does that put you in a kind of, cons I mean, you're now a conservative, basically, because that's what a conservatism is, is opposition to progress, like to progressivism, it's opposition to change, it's for preservation of the status quo, usually by attack. Not everything, not all change is good. I'm conservative when it comes to the environment. I don't want to progress into living into a polluted world. So not all, it's, I wouldn't even call it progress. <laughs> progressing. It's digressing. 
So the people who are against these, so yeah, you calling them SJWs, is fighting against the world digressing into barbarism. Attacking anyone who's trying to change things. And then at worst, it also provided this kind of cover, this big right-wing tent under which some very sinister people were found protection and community up into and including like literally Nazis, Richard Spencer, um, you know. Whose fault is that? No one forced you and Burgess and all these other clowns to embrace feminism and, and attack men like you did with your incel video. No one forced you to do that. You made the left toxic. So these guys went where they thought they could find some kind of refuge. And so they can't be concerned with the odd white nationalist that's there. The average guy's just looking out for his own, uh, you know, self, you know, preservation. They found that this was actually a great sort of recruiting method for them is that, oh, complain about the SJWs. Well, everyone likes complaining about the SJWs. So if we open up our Nazi ideas with a, with a prologue about these crazy SJWs, like, uh, it was a bad situation. So I, I decided to like, try to- Was, it's still going on. You two have to get your freaking acting gear. <laughs> Damn it. Talk to some of the people who were sort of in the, in the process of, of getting radicalized by this kind of content. You mean like your incel video here? You know, where you dump on these guys and call them like dangerous. That's, that's how, what, this is how you're going to talk to these guys. You're going to, you further radicalize them. And you know something, I think that's probably what your actual aim is, because if there's no radicals for you to talk about, then what good is your channel? Yeah, so that, that makes, uh, that makes sense to me. Uh, and, and it seems to, to work. I mean, I remember a while ago. <laughs> that makes sense to you. Burgess, holy cow. Uh, Ex-Nazis in some cases, you know, which, yeah. which seems to suggest that this does sometimes work. You know, I mean, I think there's a lot of, you know, ex-right wingers, uh, you know, ex-IDW types, um, Ex-TERFs, uh, ex-Nazis. Ex-TERFs. Ex-TERFs, this is not de-radicalizing them. You're an intersectional feminist. They're, they're trans-exclusionary. So the only thing you've done is make them not uh, hate you as a trans person. They're just as radical. They're just as man-hating as... <laughs> the intersectional feminist. So all you've done, all this ContraPoints person has done, when, is to say, oh, they don't hate me, so that's the problem solved. <laughs> that's their ID, idea of de-radicalizing. <laughs> God. In some cases, you know, which, yeah. which seems to suggest that this does sometimes work. You know, I mean, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that people tell themselves about how um, there's really no point to persuasion because. Yes, maybe some of these Nazis type heard when and said, oh, here's some fake concern. Someone who's at least pretending that they give a shit about me as a person. So <laughs> these guys take what they can get, but they haven't, nothing's changed. You think when cares about these people, this person who made that incel video? No, she's still against them. God, men are suckers. Everybody just, you know, kind of thinks what they think and, you know, and, and you're not going to, well, you're not going to get to them. Uh, and, and I wonder if, if well, a lot of that is- there, there are suckers out there. It's because of some of that, like, uh, media bubbling that you're talking about. And especially because when you do interact with representatives of other bubbles, it's likely to be the people who are the most hardcore and adamant about it because they're the only ones who would actually bother to talk to you. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, I guess when she talks to them 
to grow her channel, just like you're talking to her to grow your channel. She hasn't de-radicalized, made the world a better place in any way or form. I have a kind of mixed, more mixed history with directly interacting with like, uh, because it's one thing to kind of make content that's kind of geared to, that's that's with sort of a center or center right audience in mind. It's another thing yeah. to be like, oh, I'm going to have a debate with Ben Shapiro. You know what yeah. I mean? I, I I don't really do that so much. Um, I also think that's less helpful. In my case, I, I don't know. Maybe some people are fabulous at it. Like the streamer Destiny, I know, yeah. has had a lot of success. Destiny has had some success at growing his channel, but I've seen some of his debates. He's not that good at it. As by having these kinds of debates, um, that's maybe not my, my strong point, but I do try to make, um, I try to make these video essays where I make an argument that's sensitive to the fact that, uh, you know, if, if, if you want to convince people, then it's not. I don't really see you arguing. I see you like talking to yourself in those videos a lot of the time. But enough to just be like, here's 10 things you need to stop saying about pansexuality or whatever. Like, you know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah. Like, I think people, it's not fun to be preached at. And if you want a big audience, you have to, you have to, you, there has to be a spoon full of sugar to, to make the message. Yeah. You have to be a fence sitter like Ben Burgess. You can't make a hard, you know, core stand on anything because that's how you appeal to the biggest audience. medicine go down yeah right so i mean i think even with debates and i mean I, I guess part of the problem is that there's a lot of confusion about the relationship between making arguments which is something you do all the time that you have uh, that your um you know your videos you know you, you tend to uh to go out of your way to try to say okay this is you know this is what people who think this say they the incels, the turfs, the, the Nazis sometimes. You're an incel, Ben. To maybe to your audience who knows you, you're not, but to the outside world, when you go to like the grocery store, all the women at the grocery store don't know you from a hole in the ground. They look at your neck beard and say, oh, this guy's an incel. I hope he doesn't come within 10 yards of me. He's grousing me out. You're an incel. Sometimes, you know, or for that matter, you know, left positions that you're arguing against. Uh, and here's what's wrong with it. But there's a difference between making arguments and having this like particular kind of like public spectacle, you know, that's a debate. And, and I mean, I do think that that like spectacle has some value, but like you also have to remember that it's like only half about the actual arguments that are being presented. Like at least half of it is like rhetorical pro wrestling. Yeah. Uh, something, you know, something like that. Uh, and, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. You were saying no. I was gonna, uh, like, but I agree that in debate, it's just, it's not just a spectacle. It's a particular kind of like well, pro pro wrestling is a good analogy because it's a kind of machismo. I think that's involved a lot of the time, and that carries over into a lot of non-debate content on YouTube. Like the entire metaphor for argument is like owning destruction. Yeah. I mean, it's like this, like it's like a fairly like adolescent, like boyish kind of ethos that seems to be imported from gaming culture and really so uh, when hitchens uh made his uh, slam dunks against the religious did he did he get that from the gaming culture is he a gamer uh is he immature adolescent i've never heard anyone describe him as such he owned these religious nut jobs who, let's face it, their real purpose is to control other people's lives. And that's why people backed him. And the real difference is that Hitchens is a high status man, while the guys you're talking about are low status. That's it. It's just a difference in status. So high status men do it. They get applause. Low status men do it. They're just incels. So of course, these guys make a stand and you're someone who doesn't make a stand on anything really. So you wanna uh, make this out as something bad and what you do is something good. 
But if I bring up Hitchens and say, hey, what do you think of Hitchens? Are you going to say something negative about him and what he's done? No. The, the idea, like the metaphor for an argument is, is, is owning someone, just drawing them. Ben Shapiro wrecks so-and-so with facts and logic, right? Yeah. And like, that's another thing that I, I kind of dislike because I feel no one's like, no one's convinced by being wrecked, by being owned, right? <laughs> right, like, right, right. No, but it's for third parties. When Hitchens did this, he's not just, he's not trying to convince this guy. He, he can't convince this guy. This guy has nothing to gain. But the audience listening does. I remember a very early time video with Hitchens. It was in England. And they took a poll before and after the debate. And people shifted towards Hitchens' side. The ones that were on the fence. Some of them did. So there was a game. I mean, how do you de-radicalize someone, right? You think people that are on of the opposite actually get converted by you come on like because this is a kind of i don't know to me it's a very ma like a masculine game of trying to humili humiliate the enemy which okay sometimes hitchens is full of machismo when he, well, i should say he was when he was old because he's dead now but when he was alive he was full of machismo and he did that and you had nothing bad to say about him did you there's a place for that i'm not going to sure. say there never is but i find that i personally do not tend to be more receptive to someone's ideas if they're in the process of trying to destroy and humiliate me you know what i mean <laughs> like i find that it's actually kind of counterproductive that it's i'm not going to try and convince you of anything i know it's a waste of time because you're a self-centered person your channel is just about you so this video is about catching other people's ears. So I don't have to convince you about anything. There's maybe an entertainment goal uh, of a sort, again, only in the, mm. I'm speaking to my in-group kind of way. Uh, people who are really fabulous at it, I guess maybe can can make it good to, like I, I, there's a, a colleague of mine and a friend of mine, H Bomber guy on YouTube who, I guess he's, he's, his most famous meme moment is a response he did to Ben Shapiro about climate change, where um, he plays a clip of Ben Shapiro saying that, you know... Oh, are you going to make an exception for a friend of yours? This H-bomber guy? Won't, oh, if the sea levels rise, won't people in, in coastal homes simply sell their houses? And then H-bomber guy takes an axe to his own wall, sticks his head through the hole and, and, and shouts, sell them to who, Ben? Fucking Aquaman. And it's like, that be, that became like a meme. And, and it, it, this is definitely like, like mockery, right? But it, it, it works, right. right? It's funny. I think most people can look at that and see. Okay, so this mockery is good because you like this guy, H-bomber guy. <laughs> Do you think he's changing Ben Shapiro's mind? How ridiculous Ben Shapiro is being. Um, so I'm not, I don't want to completely discount like this type of media because I think it succeeds sometimes, but. Oh yeah. And who's the arbiter of that? Who, you? It's also, uh, and I'm not always above it myself, <laughs> but um, I did, I mean, I poured milk on a, on a, on an effigy of Jordan Peterson, but like, <laughs> I think that um, when, as far as your relationship to your audience, uh, you know, Okay, so you, you're not above that. And your H bomber guy, I've seen his crap videos too. But of course, if it's you or your friends, all of a sudden owning videos are very mature. They're not immature, they're not adolescent. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're not concerned with actually changing minds online. Well, we've seen enough of this. These people are hypocrites. Enough of this foolishness. Goodbye, everyone.